<laughs> well, the last few weeks we have been journeying through Paul's letter to Timothy, the first one, um, and have experienced Paul finding some specific solutions to specific problems with a specific group of people in Ephesus. Some of his words were not so helpful to us. Uh, and some have been used to, to hurt people over the centuries as they were taken out of context. But as we dove in and, and digested the scriptures, we learned Paul was helping Timothy do the best they could to find solutions to the problems of this group of people. They weren't supposed to be overall universal solutions for every Christian in every location over all of time. Which is convenient for me because otherwise I'd be sitting in the pew instead of right here. But today we are going to be entering into Paul's second letter to Timothy and you're going to hopefully notice a change in attitude in him. Maybe even like Paul a little bit. So this letter um, we believe is probably about three years later from the first letter. And a different circumstance um, ha is at play. Paul, instead of going on his trip to Macedonia that he mentions in the first letter, is now in Rome in prison. Which has happened to Paul many times, so it shouldn't be a big deal. Except this time, Paul is in prison under the Emperor Nero. And if you know anything about history, not specifically church history, but Nero was not the nicest emperor. He was kind of, kind of a mean guy. For example, he murdered his mother. Okay? Um, part of what we know about Nero from history is, is biased because it is his officials recording history. And so um, one of the disputes about his time as emperor was that there was a time when a great fire happened in Rome. Um, some sources, Nero's sources, say that the Christians lit Rome on fire. Other sources say that there's a chance that maybe Nero had some people light it on fire. And there are paintings of Nero playing and dancing to a harp while Rome is on fire. Because after the fire, he then starts to change, pass laws that make it permissible to persecute Christians. And he would gather them up in the multitudes and either throw them to beasts to be eaten alive, crucify them, or burn them at the stake. And so some say that Nero used this fire as his scapegoat for taking down Christians, which he didn't like their religion. Super nice guy, right? You don't look convinced. This is the guy who has Paul in prison. Do you think things are going to go well for Paul? No. This will be the last time Paul gets imprisoned before he is beheaded. This is the end of Paul's life. And this is one of the last things Paul writes before the end of his life. And so we see a very different attitude from Paul in this letter. Paul is normally the like intense go-getter that is like shows up with guns loaded, ready to go, um, and has a very different attitude in this letter. Um, and so instead of it being addressed to a church to talk about what they need to do or giving Timothy some pastoral advice, this letter has a very different feel to it once again. As Paul is trying to wrap up his ministry and talk to this young man who's likely in his 30s and prepare him for ministry when he's gone. So today in our text, um, we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 1, looking at the beginning of Paul's letter to Timothy and seeing him give some final words of encouragement and address Timothy, preparing him for 
or the worst. Um, and hopefully, in the midst of that, we may find some hope, too, uh, as we reflect on what Paul says. I encourage you to turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Um, this will be in the back half of your Bible. If you hit um, Hebrews or um, the letters of Peter, you've gone too far. You can work your way back. Um, and we'll read this in three separate chunks together, hopefully, digesting it and making some sense of it as we go. Starting in verse 3. I'm grateful to God, whom I serve with good conscience as my ancestors did. I constantly remember you in my prayers day and night. When I remember your tears, I long to see you so I can be filled with happiness. I'm reminded of your authentic faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. I'm sure that this faith is also inside of you. Because of this, I'm reminding you to revive God's gift that is in you through the laying on of my hands. This doesn't sound like the boisterous Paul that we've seen in others of his letters doing some corrections or solving some problems, but it sounds like a man who knows his future and is a little reminiscent and wanting to express some love and hope into a person. This also doesn't fit the Paul that we read in the last letter who said women are supposed to be quiet and submit to their husbands as he's commending these women, his mother and grandmother, who put the faith inside of him that it is their faith growing inside of him that he has present today and is using to serve in ministry. He commends these women for their leadership that they did to Timothy that now leads him to be able to do the same. There's a little bit of a different attitude from Paul here. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul is commending these women and remembering that faith is much more complex. It's not just one person that can claim they have the ownership of what you received. Like, less here, the only reason he loves Jesus is because of me. <coughs> That's not what Paul's doing in this moment, right? Instead, he's saying, no, I know that I commissioned you for ministry, but I also know what your mother and grandmother did for you, and they prepared you for this as well. That there is a legacy here that you come from and are carrying on. And in the same way, Paul has shifted his language about faith from simply something about a guy named Jesus, but also about something that we pass on and becomes a generational thing. That's something that we give to others as we show what we believe ourselves. A little bit of a different language that Paul has been using in this letter. But his intention here seems to involve some things that maybe we don't know about conversations that Paul and Timothy had together. He uses the phrase to revive God's gift in you as if something has been struggling inside of Timothy. He also mentions Timothy's tears. Some scholars paint a picture thinking that maybe Timothy was present when Paul was arrested. We don't necessarily have evidence of that, but the last time they saw each other, Timothy cried. And we don't know the full context of that. It could have been the difficulty of serving that church in Ephesus that we just read the letter about. That was kind of a difficult group of people. Um, or some other reason. But Paul is here wanting to encourage him and remind him of what hope he has to cling to. That even on those days when you are empty and tired, that we can feel filled up again by the hope of Christ. Perhaps today you are somebody who is weary and life has not been easy or kind as of late. And I hope that as we look into the next words we hear from Paul, we also find some hope like he is trying to give to Timothy. So let's look at verses 7 through 10. 
God didn't give us a spirit that is timid, but one that is powerful, loving, and self-controlled. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about the Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share the suffering for the good news, depending on God's power. God is the one who saved and called us with a holy calling. <clears throat> this wasn't based on what we had done, but it is based on his own purpose and grace that he gave us in Christ Jesus before time began. Now that his grace is revealed through the appearance of our Savior Christ Jesus, he destroyed death and brought life and immortality to into clear focus through the good news. Paul wants to fill Timothy back up again. For some reason, Timothy feels empty. And Paul is wanting this moment to prepare Timothy and to fill him up because hard stuff's going to come as we know that Paul's death is um, impending. It's coming. And so he points back to the hope that should revive him. Fortunately for Timothy, it's not about Timothy. His hope isn't rested in Timothy trying harder, but his hope is rested in Christ. Paul points towards Christ in this moment. And it says it's his work and what he has done that has brought us our hope. He destroyed death. He brought life and immortality. I find peace in this, and I hope that Timothy did too, feeling that his story didn't have to be perfect. That's taken care of. That even when you're empty, God's work can still happen. And God's truth can still prevail. But this isn't the last that he says to Timothy. He has a few more words to say in this section. I was appointed a messenger, apostle, and teacher of this good news. This is also why I'm suffering the way I do, but I'm not ashamed. I know the one in whom I've placed my trust. I'm convinced that God is powerful enough to protect what he has placed in my trust until that day. Hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you heard from me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Protect this good thing that has been placed in your trust through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Paul uses a little bit of his story to encourage Timothy. Paul is in prison at this moment encouraging someone who is not in prison. What a beautiful picture this paints. And Paul clinging to trust and hope. When he should sound hopeless, Paul's death is coming, but he doesn't sound hopeless. He's not ashamed of the place he is in because he knows in who he trusts. That Jesus has conquered death, and that death isn't permanent anymore. So he calls those things to memory for Timothy to remember and cling to, to hold on to those sound teachings, and to protect what those good teachings and what the good thing that was placed in you. So frequently, I think, when we think about faith, we think, oh, well, following God means I won't ever have to deal with hard stuff. Can anybody in this room tell me that that's true? No. Following God does not mean you have rainbows and butterflies, although there are currently rainbows on the floor because of the, the stained glass windows. But that doesn't always mean it's going to be easy. In fact, Paul, it seems like Paul's life, the more faithful he was to Jesus, the closer his death was coming. He was going to die because Rome was against Christians. Yet he persevered. He continued on. 
And Paul is encouraging Timothy to keep going and to hold true to things. Not because he's going to have an easy life, but because it's going to be difficult. What I love about looking into church history and looking into stories like Timothy's is that we see that the story of Christ has a bigger picture than just me or just you. It's for more than just me. I'm grateful that, that I'm included in this bunch, but I'm also grateful to see the bigger picture and to see that there is a legacy that keeps going, even though Christian, Christians are imperfect people. That the story doesn't end just because we make mistakes or, or are running on empty. But God's truth can prevail. I look at the story of Lois and Eunice, and Paul doesn't call them perfect women. He doesn't say that they've never made a mistake and so follow that perfection, but talks about their faith being something to emulate. <coughs> A faith that was in them first that he, Timothy, should also pick up. And as I think about their legacy, I want us to think about the legacy of liberty. Liberty exists because faith has been passed on from generation to generation. This is the third building that I know of for liberty. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. And if you walk in the cemetery out there, you can see generations. Some of you still have last names of those generations that are out there. And are, uh, have a name representation of the legacy that's been passed on. And what I hope we hear as we think about the people that are out there in the cemetery and think about legacy is that Liberty keep, kept going, even though we know those people weren't perfect. One of my favorite stories that John told me was about the fact that we had two Confederate soldiers buried out in Liberty's um, cemetery. And one of them was a Confederate soldier because he was mad at the um, Union Army for taking his horses. And so he went and signed up for the Confederacy to fight for them because he was mad. Okay, you know, like, that guy's not a perfect person, but you, we get it, and liberty is still here today. And so my hope in this is as we look at the legacy of this church, you find peace where you're at. And know that it's okay to be in the midst of some imperfection, to be in the midst of uncertainties or questions, but also to remember to, to cling to the legacy that's here. To be present with the people in this church that can remind you and revive you when you're feeling empty. Timothy was feeling empty and Paul, on his basically deathbed, is encouraging him. And in this moment, we remember as a church our role to each other and to this community. To help revive each other when we see people in the church that are running empty and to help perpetuate the legacy of, of Christ and passing that on to the next generations. Like the little biddies that were sitting out here a little bit ago. We do the work so that we can prepare it for them to take over. And eventually it won't be our building and our church happening, but their church happening and them running it, making decisions. Maybe they paint the walls of fuchsia in that. But you know what? It's theirs. I want us to reflect on our legacy, the people who have made us where we are today, to find hope in that maybe we're not in our perfect spot, but that God's truth doesn't depend on how perfect I am. It's about how perfect Jesus is. And that we can perpetuate that legacy by clinging to that and clinging to each other to be revived when we're feeling empty. May you feel revived by the legacy 
that you come from and prepare yourself to leave a legacy behind for those who are still coming. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the times that we are empty. It's the times that I'm empty that I realize how much I need you and how much you fuel me. Lord, I pray that we experience gratitude for those times and also remember the root of what fills us up. That we are able to lean into the people who can remind us of your truth, remind us of the faith that we cling to and pass on to generations to come. And to look at their story to remind us of your faithfulness. So that when we're having a weak day, that we can keep going, knowing you are faithful and strong. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. We are going to transition to a time of communion together. And um, for the sake of legacy, we are going to um, do communion like we, the liberties we're most familiar with, but the deacons will come forward and we'll pass plates. Um, so you will get to enjoy and just sit this time <laughs> instead of getting up and moving forward. Um, so I want to invite the deacons forward to prepare blessings on the elements.
In remembrance of Christ, we also share the cup and ask Johnny to pray over the cup. Father, as we're gathered here this morning at your table, we are truly humbled to be in your presence. We are blessed to be here as a family, as your church family. As we take this communion, as we remember your body that was broken for us, may you please forgive us for our sins and renew our bodies and our spirits and our strength. And we will do this in remembrance of you. Lord, in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.